Hello, and welcome to Basics to Brilliance Hematology Podcast, the podcast series that will take your basic hematology knowledge up to a level needed to be an effective hematology registrar. We hope that the content we cover here will help you prepare for the dreaded hematology FRC Path Part 1 examination. But most importantly, we hope that this series fills you with excitement for the fantastic, dynamic and highly rewarding specialty of haematology. My name is Dr. and Harrod Everden, Haematology ST5 Registrar in the South West Deanery. And my name is Dr. David Fazy, Haematology SHO, with aspirations to be a haemorrhage. And let's get started on today's topic. From basics to brilliance. Hi, David. Nice to see you again. Hello. Yeah, no, happy to be here. Great. Uh, So today we're going to talk about uh, CNS lymphoma. Which is a topic I am incredibly ignorant about. (laughs) Okay. Well, today we're just going to do primary CNS lymphoma rather than other types of lymphoma. And we'll talk a bit more about that. But I guess a good place to start would be just to ask you, what is CNS lymphoma, primary CNS lymphoma? Um, So I know it's rare, and from what I understand, it's any kind of lymphoma that affects the brain. Yeah, good, exactly. And you're right, it is actually quite rare in terms of what it represents in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's only about 1% of all non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and 3% of all brain tumours. So you're right, it is relatively rare, and it's any lymphoma that affects the brain. Um, and do you know what is the most common histological subtype of CNS lymphoma? Um, so, so an assumption, I assume that it's diffuse large B based on the fact that diffuse large B tends to be everywhere and gets everywhere. OK, yeah, that, I mean, that is a correct assumption. Um, so the most common subtype, 90 percent of histology on biopsy of a CNS lymphoma is um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma or DLBCL. Um so yeah, that's correct. Uh, so <laughs> if it's so common, 90%, is it is it worth thinking about any of the other lymphomas or is it just diffuse large B? That's our that's our bread and butter. Yeah, so it's a good question. And um I tend to not think about CNS lymphoma in terms of the hist- histological subtype. Um, because of that very reason, because so much of CNS lymphoma is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, I tend to think a more useful way of thinking about it clinically is dividing it into three main types. So you've got primary CNS lymphoma, which is where it is originated or it is only affecting the brain. Secondary CNS lymphoma, which is lymphoma that has... um, either started in the body and relapsed into the brain or has concurrently occurred both in the body and in the brain. Um, So you sort of have three subtypes of secondary CNS lymphoma, synchronous CNS and systemic lymphoma at presentation, which is known as treatment naive secondary CNS lymphoma. You've got relapsed isolated secondary CNS lymphoma, And then you've got relapsed concomitant secondary CNS lymphoma. And those are kind of your three um, kinds of secondary. And then I also like to think of um, immune deficient, immune deficiency associated CNS lymphoma, which is a third kind. So that's things like your CNS lymphoma that's associated with HIV. And that is a specific separate type because actually it does quite well compared to the rest of your CNS Uh, lymphoma disease which I find interesting because unlike things like post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease which we will do at some point as a type of lymphoma also seen in the context of immunosuppression HIV associated CNS lymphoma actually has a much better prognosis which I always think is quite interesting so that's how I would think about it primary disease secondary CNS lymphoma and then immune deficiency associated CNS lymphoma and today we're just going to focus on primary CNS lymphoma because it's got quite a different um, treatment algorithm to that of secondary CNS disease. Okay cool. So how do you think that primary CNS lymphoma might present David? So I, I'm, I was thinking about this and I thought that it probably, like any kind of space-occupying lesion, it probably depends on where it is 
in, in the head. Okay. Yep. Um, and I should think things like behavioral changes, maybe problems with language or word finding, yep. any kind of motor deficits, sort of focal problems. Um, and then I guess leading to things like seizures and and that kind of that kind of symptomatic things. Yeah, absolutely. So completely it it's a massive range of things and i think the key thing is as you say where it affects the brain where in the brain it is um will determine what sort of symptoms you get um always think about your red flags for any space occupying lesion so features of raised intracranial pressure in particular a headache that occurs first thing in the morning commonly associated with um nausea and vomiting first thing in the morning from lying down at night and the pressure building in your head um also remember it can present with neuropsychiatric symptoms as well, as well as classic sort of stroke, focal motor type symptoms. As you said, behavioral change, language impairment, memory impairment as well, seizures, as you said. Um, and you can also get a uveitis or visual changes where it can it can just affect the back of the eye. Um, so quite a wide range. Um, okay, so I've got a person, they've turned up, they've got these changes. Um, I'm suspecting a space occupying lesion. Um, what what am I doing investigations wise? Okay, so I would always start with a set of blood tests. Um, so you're going to do a full blood count. The reason you're doing that is to look to see whether there's any clues as to whether the bone marrow might be involved. Um, because if you've got spread of this lymphoma from the brain or from the bone marrow to the brain, vice versa, I guess you don't know which one might have come first. But if you're looking to basically exclude a secondary um, CNS lymphoma. So you want to do a full blood count to look to see if there's any signs of anemia or thrombocytopenia or neutropenia. And likewise, a blood film to see if there's any abnormal lymphocytes circulating in the blood. You're going to do baseline kidney function and liver function tests. And you're also going to do an LDH because that has prognostic significance for primary CNS lymphoma. Um, you're going to do virology, so hepatitis B, C and HIV, uh, because you're anticipating that you might need to start chemotherapy. So with all lymphomas, you always do those basic virology, particularly also HIV is relevant because of looking for immune deficiency associated um, CNS lymphoma and then you've also got your immunoglobulins and serum protein electrophoresis to look for any evidence of a paraprotein that might give you a clue for example could this be um, a bing neal syndrome so Waldenstrom's disease affecting the brain for example where you might expect to see an IgM paraprotein so those are probably the initial blood tests that I would start with and then biopsy is absolutely key so what problems do you think there might be in getting a biopsy in this situation, David? Um, this might be just my naivety. Um, the, the brain's fragile and I guess accessibility is a problem. You know, yeah. I guess lymph nodes tend to be pretty superficial and you can stick a needle in them quite happily. But I guess if they're, they have deep structures that you're trying to get to in the brain or the brain stem, that yeah. would be uh, problematic. Absolutely. So yes, that's one really difficult part of, um, of of making a diagnosis of CNS lymphoma is that if you've got a lump of disease on a scan, which is in a place like the brainstem, for example, sometimes they're just really inaccessible to get to as a biopsy without causing serious harm to the patient. So yes, absolutely. That is, that is one issue, is accessibility to get to a, the biopsy. But one of the other really big issues is... Um, you know, obviously every part of your brain you need. And so by taking a biopsy, you're taking a bit of your brain out. And so what we recommend is doing what's called stereotactic biopsy with intraoperative rapid cytology and review of the frozen sections. And what that allows you to do is make sure whilst the patient is there on the table that you've got an adequate amount of tissue, but without taking more than you might need. OK, so um, that's really important for limiting the amount of unnecessary brain that you might remove in order to get a diagnostic piece of tissue to make a diagnosis. OK. And yeah, then, that makes sense. I guess 
I guess yeah. being a greedy pathologist, we'd like as much as possible. Well, exactly. But if you strip strip delicate areas of their brain in the meantime, yes, uh, there might not be much of a patient left to thank you for your exactly. smartness. Exactly, exactly. So it's that's really important. Um, and the other really difficult thing, um, which I've just recently seen a case actually um, on the ward, is uh, a patient who had had steroids for quite some time on and off before getting a biopsy, and um, steroids are um, the devil in this situation because if you give somebody steroids you make it really likely that your biopsy is not going to be diagnostic because lymphoma doesn't like steroids this is a diffuse large b-cell lymphoma it will therefore likely be steroid sensitive and it may disappear completely before you've managed to get a biopsy and obviously when these patients come in with their space occupying lesion query cause you know, we've already said only 3% of brain tumours are lymphoma. So that means that most brain tumours, it's very appropriate when you see a nasty CT scan um, to start them on dexamethasone as a sort of knee-jerk reaction. Um, But actually that can be really problematic when it comes to CNS lymphoma. So the sort of stats we're talking about are if you've had less than one week of steroids, so less than seven days of steroid, then um, a third of patients will have a non-diagnostic biopsy. And if you've had more than seven days of steroids, then 60% of patients roughly will have a non-diagnostic biopsy. So that's a really big problem. And sometimes the lesion can disappear completely by the time that you've thought about CNS lymphoma. And in that situation, you need to stop steroids and then re-image at two to four weeks and basically hope that a lesion has come back that you can then... I, I was going to say, that's the irony, isn't it? You, yeah. you, you, know, you pack yourself on the back and then wait two weeks because you've actually done a too good a job. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Without a diagnosis, you're a bit blind. Well, yes, because steroids are only going to shrink it down. They're not mm. any sort of definitive treatment. So it, it, it is likely to come back. Most places now, this is less of a problem because most places have a neurosurgical pathway to um, allow you to uh, get quite a rapid biopsy. And the neurosurgeons sort of are more and more appreciating the importance of getting a biopsy really quickly and minimizing steroids. So um, I would say it's still the neurosurgeon's decision as to whether they think a specific patient based on imaging does need steroids in the interim. But um, they also understand that actually it's really important to get a biopsy as soon as possible. And particularly, I think um, there's a better understanding now that even a very elderly patient with not necessarily a very good performance status can benefit from having a biopsy of a brain lesion if it is possible lymphoma. Because actually treatment of um, a CNS lymphoma compared to maybe some of the other solid brain tumours can really lead to an improvement in the quality of life of that patient, which sometimes can be difficult for people to appreciate when they're experiencing mainly solid brain tumours that may not have that benefit in a very elderly patient. So um, it's about getting early biopsy in um, and communicating well with the neurosurgeons as to whether the patient has steroids or not, and really trying to minimise the steroids before biopsy. The lady that um, I mentioned earlier has been through three years of of hell of not having um, a diagnosis for what started off as very strange neurology and looked like inflammation and demyelination on scans. And so she was given um, recurrent steroids for what was deemed to be likely demyelinating condition of some kind. And of course, the lymphoma went away with the steroids each time and she did get better. And it's only been very recently where the lymphoma has really progressed that they've managed to get a biopsy quite a lot. Well, three years down the line on and off being disabled from her neurological symptoms. And so I think that's just a case that's always going to stick with me in terms of making sure that we don't have patients on steroids and that we really prioritise getting an early biopsy wherever possible. I guess I was just going to say, I would suggest, I guess if someone comes through ED, gets a scan of their head, there's something in there going on, the chances of them referring to haematology early enough to go, mm. whoa, let's hold fire on the, being so heavy on the steroids to get a biopsy is probably yeah. quite quite low, isn't it? Yeah, which is why patients that are now up for having a biops- a brain biopsy, they do go through these neurosurgical pathways where there is a better awareness of that. And that's exactly the point. Um, So that has really improved things.
Um, other things that you can do, so we've talked about bloods, we've talked about biopsy. The third thing is a lumbar puncture. Now, I have to be honest, we don't routinely do this all the time. It is routinely done as part of trials, but it's not routinely done as part of a diagnostic workup for most patients with CNS lymphoma, in my experience. Um, CSF protein levels are prognostic, so where it's feasible and easy to do and the patient is very keen for a lumbar puncture, then you can. Um, and it's also very helpful for picking up leptomeningeal disease, of which about sort of 15% of patients will have leptomeningeal disease, which sometimes can be missed on MRI. And so you can pick it up on a lumbar puncture um, CSF instead. And I guess a lumbar puncture, the, when, the time when I would really be considering it is if um, a biopsy is impossible. So when we were talking earlier about, you know, maybe a really inaccessible brain stem lesion, um, then instead you can try and pick up CNS lymphoma by collecting CSF. Um, what test would you send the CSF for in particular when you're looking for a primary CNS uh, lymphoma, David? Um, so I'd, I'd want flow. I think that would be the big one. So I can yep. see what type of cells we've got going on and what type of markers they're presenting. Yes. I think if those look like a sort of a, a typical diffuse large B type picture, I might yep. be more suspicious that this is a lymphoma going on. Yes. Um, and that's that's about it. <laughs> that's the limit of what I what I what I know. Yeah, no, so flow will be really important. Um and getting as much CSF as possible for that and analyzing it rapidly will massively improve the sensitivity um for picking up any clonal B cells within the CSF. Um other things that you can do is a cytospin. So um this is where you basically centrifuge the CSF to create a little pellet of any cells that are in the CSF at the bottom of the tube. And then you kind of basically scrape that out and um, smush it on a slide and then have a look at it under the microscope to actually just look at the morphology of the white blood cells that you can see um, in the CSF. And so, so, so similar to a peripheral blood smear, but yeah, it is CSF. similar. Yeah, exactly. But without all the red cells, um, hopefully, unless you've got a lot of red cells, <laughs> yeah. contamination from a bad tap. Um, but, uh, uh, um, a cytospin that is very positive with um, can be very informative. So in patients that I've seen, this is not CNS lymphoma, but in patients with uh, relapsed ALL in the CSF in the brain, um, you know, when you hold the slide, the cytospin slide up to the light and you can see a big blue blob, you know, there's going to be far too many uh, white blood cells in that CSF before you even look at it under the microscope you know you kind of already have a feeling of knowing you're dealing with something bad so you know a C obviously that's an extreme example but um, a cytospin is really important for looking at the morphology and then we said about protein for um, prognostic purposes and then PCR for IGHV gene rearrangement so um, that's one of your immunoglobulin um, genes and that can be rearranged in clonal B cell disorders and you can do PCR for that and that can be quite sensitive um, and I think that's an area um, of research that is going to increase is is possibly um, more PCR targets on CSF uh, in the future, maybe to avoid so much in the way of um, invasive biopsies or for these patients where you can't biopsy them. So, so sorry, uh, sorry, that's so that's looking at chromosomal problems, but not like fish. Yeah, exactly. It's PCR. So it's it's looking for a specific um, gene target um, that okay. uh, you have you add primers to and then, you know, you do your um, your your number of amplifications that are required to detect the presence or absence of a gene. Um, so so that that is a new sort of technology that is starting to be developed for um, uh, looking at the CSF in a bit more detail in CNS lymphoma. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's lumbar puncture. Then imaging. So most patients will probably start with a CT head when they come through A&E, but um, you also need to do a contrast enhanced, so a gadolinium enhanced MRI scan of the brain. Um, you don't routinely need to do the spine unless you have reasons to suspect that the spine is involved clinically. 
Um, or if you think that uh, that that it will alter management in some way, then you can do an MRI of the spine. But generally, it's just MRI head. Um, and then you need to stage the patient. So do you know what sort of investigations I'm talking about here? Um, no. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair, because you, you would think, well, you know, what is there to uh, stage? It's all in the brain. So it's surely just yeah fine to the brain my, my usual sort of yeah my normal number scale doesn't really apply if it's all yeah. upstairs yeah exactly um and what i mean by staging is really um ruling out uh, systemic lymphoma and ensuring that this is therefore a primary cns lymphoma and not a secondary cns lymphoma by looking for evidence of any concomitant disease within the rest of the body and that's really, really important because that will really influence your treatment from from the beginning um, as to whether you're treating this as a primary or a secondary CNS lymphoma. And that's why we're going to talk about secondary CNS lymphoma in a different session so that we don't confuse the two. So the investigations that we need to do are a PET CT of the body to look for any FDG avid disease anywhere in the body and to check that there's nothing. PET is much better than just a plain CT with contrast, um, particularly because it's better and more sensitive at picking up extra nodal disease and you don't want to miss anything really. Um, the other thing is in men, you want to get a testicular ultrasound. Do you know why you want to get a testicular ultrasound? Is this sort of areas of privilege? We're talking about where immune cells can go and hang out and they sort of don't get infiltrated by sort of the normal immune system. Yeah. So essentially the, the testicles have a, a like the brain, have a blood brain barrier and a blood testicle barrier, which means that chemotherapy is not as good at penetrating through to treat any potential lymphoma cells within the testicle. And therefore it does influence management and what we would do about it. And therefore it's very important that we exclude testicular involvement in any male with CNS lymphoma. The reason we have to do an ultrasound scan is because we know that PET scans alone are not sufficient to exclude primary DLBCL within the testicle. Okay. So um, the, the other thing that we need to do to stage the patient is uh, we need to do ophthalmoscopy. So we need to look in the eye and we need to get our friendly ophthalmologist to do a, a slit lamp exam for us. I was I was slightly concerned you were going to make me do fundoscopy there, which, you know, <laughs> is clearly a dark art that no one outside of the, the dark rooms of ophthalmology can do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we get them to do that, um, plus or minus a vitreal biopsy if there's any uncertainty about whether the back of the eye might be involved. Because again, uh, that can also be that also requires a different management approach in, involving radiotherapy a lot of the time. We don't need to do a bone marrow biopsy, however, if everything looks normal. So you've got a normal full blood count, no paraprotein suggests an underlying low grade lymphoma. And and no other sort of concerns for bone marrow disease on a PET scan, then actually you don't need to do a bone marrow biopsy. So that's something that you can leave out and that you can trust PET scans to rule out uh, whether there's bone marrow involvement. So PETs are trustworthy for bone marrow and CNS disease, but they're not trustworthy for testicle involvement or the eyes. OK, so your staging involves one, a PET scan two, a testicular ultrasound scan, and three, ophthalmoscopy with a slit lamp exam, plus or minus vitreal biopsy combined with a subretinal aspirate and a, a biopsy of anything of concern in the back of the eye. So that's what I mean yeah. by staging. And, and once yeah. you're done with that, then you'll be happy that you're really dealing with a primary CNS lymphoma rather than a secondary one. And that's, that's really important. So... I guess then the other thing to say, just whilst we've been banging on about steroids and how much we don't want the patient to have them until we get a biopsy, remember that steroids can also affect your PET scans as well. So that's another reason why you want to try and avoid steroids until you've got your PET scan and got your biopsy, because you don't want to have a falsely reassuring PET scan on the basis of having had recent steroids, for example. Um, anything else that you think might be important at baseline, David? Um, so I guess, I guess the, the regime in this uh, is, is pretty nasty. 
So I guess having a decent baseline for your patient, I guess both cognitively and from a performance status is probably important. Um, and possibly uh, any sort of past medical history or pre-morbid features which you would 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 make you worried about them going forth. Absolutely. So a baseline cognitive assessment um, as a minimum doing a mini mental state exam, but ideally a sort of formal neuropsychiatric assessment and cognitive assessment is really important because it allows you to sort of track how the patient is doing from that point of view, because cognition and memory are really important markers of a patient's quality of life as well. And so you want to know that these things are improving as you carry on with treatment rather than getting worse. So that's really important to do at baseline. The performance status assessment is the other really important thing, as you said. And in particular, I'm interested in in two things to do with performance status. Obviously, the standard ECOG of performance status, but also your echo to assess your cardiac function and a creatinine clearance to assess your kidney function because both the heart and the kidneys are going to have a bit of a rough time with high dose methotrexate and we want to make sure therefore that we feel the patient is fit enough for those and I like that you touched on pre-morbid past medical history and performance status because I think that's really important and cannot be emphasized enough in primary CNS lymphoma a lot of these patients are going to look pretty shocking by the time they come into hospital with their neurological symptoms signs and they may well therefore have quite a bad performance status you know they've they've got disease in their brain so they might not be able to move they might not be able to get out of bed more than 50 percent of the day making their performance status a three or a four and actually it's really important to understand that that's probably quite an acute deterioration. We're talking about 90% of these CNS lymphoma patients having uh, a high-grade histological type, DLBCL, and so therefore it's growing quite quickly over a short period of time. And so what's actually important for us to understand and assess before starting treatment and deciding how intensive to go is their pre-morbid performance status. So it's about two or three weeks ago, before they started becoming unwell and rapidly declining in their performance status from their CNS lymphoma, how were they? You know, were they renovating a house or were they working full time or, you know, driving a car and running after three children? If this is the case, then that's the performance status that's relevant. If, however, they've been in bed Uh, not doing very much, very frail because of other reasons, then actually that's somebody that you may not want to treat so intensively. So it's really important to look past the patient that's directly in front of you, which can feel strange and appreciate that actually these patients um, may well improve their performance status with treatment. And that is commonly seen. So remember, it's about pre-morbid performance status and getting a really good collateral history from the family as a result as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's really useful. Yeah, I think I, I guess with other sort of space occupying lesions, if they're more slow growing, you know, you've got to actually got a, a pretty good idea of what well, their performance status. But it, yeah, you know, lymphomas tend to come on pretty heavy and pretty hard. That's the thing. And so, if you haven't been at a poor performance status for very long, the chances are you're probably going to be able to recover back to where you were before you've got muscle wasting and all the other things. So yeah. Okay, so I've banged on about that for a while. So I guess the only other thing to say is what if the lesion is genuinely somewhere you can't biopsy? Can you still make a diagnosis of CNS lymphoma and then commit that patient to chemotherapy for that? And I guess the the sort of criteria that the at least the BSH guideline uses are that if you have characteristic findings on an MRI scan, and you have clinical features, and you have evidence of clonal B cells in the CSF or vitreous fluid at the back of the eye, using flow and or PCR for that gene rearrangement we were talking about, the IGHV gene rearrangement, then you can still make a diagnosis of primary CNS lymphoma. Um, 
That's still quite heavy criteria. You've got to have classical appearance on an MRI and clinical features and evidence of clonal B cells. And it's no wonder that the the lady I was talking about earlier, that clinical case that went on for three years of her not having a diagnosis, it's no wonder that she'd never quite made it to having, you know, a confirmed diagnosis of CNS lymphoma. Um, So sometimes we have to be pragmatic about it. But you have to do your absolute best to at least demonstrate malignant disease if you can of some sort of B cell origin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can see the challenge. Yeah. Okay. So we, we've got through all the hurdles. We've ticked all the boxes and now we, we've you know, got a confirmed diagnosis of, of CNS lymphoma. Um, how are we treating this? Okay. So, I think the first thing to think about in the treatment of primary CNS lymphoma is that we have two stages to our treatment. The first stage is induction, and this is about getting the patient into remission. Okay, and your options there, you've got a couple of options, um, and I'll just briefly, uh, I'll go through them in more detail in a minute, but you've got matrix, you've got the MARTA approach, and you've got then more more abbreviated things like single dose high dose meth- single agent high dose methotrexate okay but so you've got varying intensities of chemotherapy all of which have a methotrexate based flavor to them and that's the induction to get them into remission and then you've also got consolidation and consolidation is about improving the durability of the remission that you've achieved to deepen the response for the patient to increase the chances of them having a long-term cure. And your options there are either whole brain radiotherapy or an autologous stem cell transplant, okay? And so considering those two stages of treatment, induction and consolidation, you're then faced with two initial decisions to make at the beginning when you meet the patient and you've got your diagnosis of primary CNS lymphoma. The first one is choice of induction. And um, so this is choice of chemotherapy, essentially. And the big thing that influences this is um, age. Okay, and the reason why age is such a big influencer in choice of induction uh, is because we would feel very nervous to give somebody matrix chemotherapy, which is our most intensive induction chemotherapy to somebody over the age of 70, because the data comes from a trial that excluded people over the age of 70. So therefore, you would be going into very uncharted territory, okay, which would feel a bit scary because it's quite intensive treatment. So age is really important in terms of choice of induction. And if your patient's over 65, 70, you might be thinking of a more martyr type approach. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. So that's the first thing. And then the second decision you need to make is is this patient fit for an autologous stem cell transplant? Because ideally, you want to give people an autologous stem cell transplant rather than radiotherapy as their consolidation. But you need to make sure that they're fit enough to be able to have the autologous stem cell transplant. And here, age is less important. And actually, what's more important is their pre-morbid performance status that we were talking about earlier and their past medical history. So do they have chronic kidney disease, heart disease, other things that are going to make them physiologically fall apart when you give them the high intensity chemotherapy required for them to have an autologous stem cell transplant? So um, and 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 a lot of leaders in the field of CNS lymphoma would now say that actually very few patients are not fit for an autologous stem cell transplant uh, as a general rule, because you can dose adjust things like the thiotipa that is given before the stem cells are given back. So actually, if you can give people an autologous stem cell transplant as consolidation in CNS lymphoma, then you should, because it's a really important part of treatment. So those are your two upfront decisions. And so so then from there, you can then decide what you what what you want to give people. OK, and um, so you've got a bit of I guess it's evidence based, isn't it? Uh, you're not saying that people over 70 can't have this. You're just saying that there isn't the there isn't the evidence base to say this is possible or no, no, sorry, not possible. But they, there's not the evidence base to say that this is useful. Yes, that it's in the patient's okay. interest. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so, so given given that, how how do you decide? Is there what what's out there that helps you make those decisions? Yeah. So I think to understand how we treat primary CNS lymphoma. I think we just need to go through the sort of main trials that were done in CNS lymphoma because it's quite it, it's only been recently that we've had these great publications which have really helped influence how we manage these patients because it's quite a rare type of lymphoma as we said at the beginning and in 2022 it seemed that there were quite a few quite pivotal trials that were published which have really helped us to have more of an idea uh, as to how to treat uh, CNS, primary CNS lymphoma. So the first trial is called the IELSG32 study. It rolls off the tongue, that one. (laughs) And it was published in Leukaemia in 2022. And essentially, it was a really important randomised control trial with seven years of follow-up data, in which it looked at both what induction is best for your patients under the age of 70. So your young fit patients with primary CNS lymphoma, which induction is the best? And then it also then looked at which consolidation is the best. So in terms of which induction is the best, it randomized patients to three arms, methotrexate and cytarabine, methotrexate, cytarabine and rituximab, or methotrexate, cytarabine, thiotipa, and rituximab, also known as matrix, okay? And it showed that the matrix arm was the best in terms of overall survival. And actually, we now know that from this data, patients treated with matrix chemotherapy and then consolidation with an autologous stem cell transplant had a seven-year overall survival of 70%. So that's more than half of patients were still alive with their CNS lymphoma seven years down the line, which is quite impressive. Um, And then they also randomized patients after induction with one of those three arms. They then randomized them to consolidation with either an autologous stem cell transplant using thiotipa or whole brain radiotherapy. And they found that actually the efficacy was very similar for whole brain radiotherapy and the autologous stem cell transplant. However, whole brain radiotherapy resulted in an impairment in attentiveness and executive functions as the autologous stem cell transplant patients actually experienced an improvement in those um, as well as better memory and, and quality of life. So basically, both consolidation methods are good but the side effects of the whole brain radiotherapy were in the opposite direction to that of um, doing an autologous stem cell transplant. And when we're talking about things like memory and cognition, actually, that those have a big impact on people's quality of life. So it was a really important study, and it's basically provided us with the knowledge of how we should probably be treating um, our first-line primary CNS lymphoma patients that are fit enough for intensive chemo and an autologous stem cell transplant. They should have matrix, and then they should have an autologous stem cell transplant. So that was the first trial. The second study was something called the MARTA study, which was published in Blood in November 2022. And the aim of this was to look at treatment of primary CNS lymphoma in fit older patients. So you had to be over the age of 65 for this trial, but you had to be deemed as fit enough for an autologous stem cell transplant. And so they had two cycles of methotrexate, cytarabine and rituximab, i.e. matrix, but without the thiotipa. And then they had an autologous stem cell transplant after that. And their survival rates were comparable to that of younger cohorts. So that was a real success. So it was less intensive. And um, the thiotipa in particular is the one that they got rid of because that is very myelosuppressive and so was associated with the low full blood count, um, the neutropenias and the infections and toxicity. So that's what people mean when they talk about the MARTA approach in primary CNS lymphoma. They're talking about patients that are a bit older, so over 65, but still fit. And so therefore, that's how you'd be treating them with a, with essentially matrix without the thiotipa plus an autologous stem cell transplant. 
And then the third trial was the PROMAIN study, and the PROMAIN study was published in 2017. And this was looking at patients over the age or equal to 65 years old, um, given just uh, high-dose methotrexate, rituximab, and oral procarbazine for at least four cycles, followed by six months of um, oral procarbazine maintenance instead of an auto. And so these patients are ones that are not fit for an autologous stem cell transplant. That's probably the approach that you would take. So that induction followed by maintenance with procarbazine for six months. So based on all of that trial evidence, if you're less than 70, you've got a performance status of less than or equal to two, then you should have matrix um, and an autologous stem cell transplant in which you usually will have four cycles of matrix. So usually two cycles of matrix, harvest the stem cells, another two cycles of matrix, followed by an autologous stem cell transplant. If you're over 70 or over 65, but you've got a good performance status and you're fit enough for an autologous stem cell transplant, then treat as the martyr approach. So essentially matrix, but without the thiotipa plus an autologous stem cell transplant. And usually it's just two cycles of the martyr approach followed by an auto. And then if you're not fit for an autologous stem cell transplant, so your performance status is sort of greater than or equal to three, then uh, the PROMAIN approach might be more appropriate, followed by maintenance with oral procarbazine for six months. And then obviously remember that if you've got a patient that's really not fit for a haircut, so maybe they're older and they're very comorbid and frail and they had a very bad pre-morbid performance status, then remember that palliative options are also often appropriate. So that could just be in the form of dexamethasone or oral chemotherapy called temozolomide, or sometimes whole brain radiotherapy um, as a palliative approach. Um, and sometimes in the context of leptomeningeal disease, where they're not fit enough for any systemic chemotherapy, then intrathecal chemotherapy for local disease control may have a role. But note that none of the other treatment approaches that I've talked about have involved intrathecals, and we don't generally do intrathecals for primary CNS lymphoma. Okay, understood. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've seen people on Matrix, okay. and it looks it looks pretty vicious, and a lot of them end up as inpatients for quite a decent period of time. Does that sound about right? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you say that, actually. We probably should go through Matrix in a bit more detail, because it is the main uh, primary CNS lymphoma treatment that we give um, in induction. So it is quite intensive, David, you're right. But there is method in uh, in that and it needs to be intensive because the drugs that you're giving in CNS lymphoma, you do have to give in quite intensive, quite high doses to get them at a concentration that's high enough in the blood that enough of the chemo will cross over into the blood brain barrier. And it's that blood brain barrier that really isn't our friend in this situation. So a typical sort of schedule for matrix is you have rituximab on what we call day zero and day one. And then on day one, you give lots of fluids as well before you give the methotrexate. And then on day two, you then give what we call high dose methotrexate at a whopping dose of 3.5 grams per meter squared. OK, so that works out as a lot of methotrexate for patients. And um, you have to rapidly infuse that as well. So you rapidly infuse a very large dose of 3.5 grams per meter squared of methotrexate over two to four hours to maximize the therapeutic CSF concentration and the blood brain barrier penetration, essentially. And so you give that really quickly. And then on day three, you then will um, give them folinic acid to reverse that methotrexate. Because essentially what you've done is given that patient a lethal dose of methotrexate, which if you told a rheumatologist, they would be horrified. Um, so you give folinic acid uh, 24 hours after having bathed the brain in this methotrexate to rapidly reverse the, the anti-folate metabolism effects of the methotrexate. Mm -hmm. 
and lots of IV fluids until the methotrexate level is less than 0.1 micromoles per litre. And so you then will start measuring the methotrexate level, usually 48 hours after you've given the methotrexate, and you measure it daily until it's less than 0.1. And when it's less than 0.1 in the blood, then you can stop the folinic acid, stop the fluids, stop the urine alkalinization, um, and, and your patient is then safe as it were from that methotrexate lethal effect and then day three you give twice a day cytarabin day four you give twice a day cytarabin and then day five you give thiotipa so so it, yeah in a, in a word yes it is vicious yeah it is it is it is yeah um but but it's necessary and so because the methotrexate requires so much in the way of fluid that's why we worry about the heart baseline and we need a ideally a left ventricular ejection fraction of greater than 45%. And you also need good kidneys to clear it. So you need a creatinine clearance of greater than 50 for matrix as well. Um, otherwise, you can dose adjust the, well, you need to dose adjust the methotrexate for the renal function. Um, you give the chemotherapy as a three-weekly cycle. So that's that's kind of the standard amount of time it takes for patients to get through a cycle of matrix. However, the shorter, the better. So as soon as the patient's counts recover, if they're a really young patient with really springy bone marrow, then they may recover their counts before three weeks. And so you should aim to restart your next cycle of chemotherapy as soon as their counts recover, really. Because again, you're just trying to maintain that treatment intensity. And you will do a maximum of four cycles um, usually with stem cell collection post cycle two. So day 13, 14, 15, you give GCSF and, uh, you know, days before, and then you collect their stem cells using a apheresis machine and then freeze their stem cells in liquid nitrogen ready for reinfusion later on during consolidation. And with the matrix chemotherapy, I would say something of note is that there is quite a high treatment related mortality associated with the chemotherapy. So your risk of dying from methotrexate uh, from matrix chemotherapy is about four to seven percent. But what's interesting is most of that treatment related mortality is within the first cycle of chemotherapy. And therefore, it's really important that if you are worried about somebody's performance status, let's say pre-morbid, they were really well. They'd been uh, installing a kitchen and uh, had been very fit and then had a very rapid decline. And now their performance status is really a bit dodgy and you're a bit you're a bit unsure as to whether you're going to go for matrix or not. It's really important that you dose reduce um, the chemotherapy in the matrix regime. And the chemo that you will generally dose reduce is the cytarabin. So you have four doses of cytarabin within matrix. And so what you can do is just remove a dose. So you give them three doses instead of four of the cytarabin. It's really, I'm making a point about that because that is a 25% dose reduction. But what I haven't done is do a 25% reduction in dose of each of the cytarabin doses. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, yeah. And Absolute the, number's been reduced, but not the, yes. the, the dose in each one. Yeah. Because the reason for that is you need to maintain chemo intensity, the concentration, the crossing across the blood-brain barrier. So you don't just dose reduce each one of the four by 25%. It's much better to keep three and knock off one. Um, and so if you're unsure, you're not so happy about their performance status, do a 25 or do a 50% dose reduction by knocking off some of those cytarabins. Obviously, you want to give them as much treatment as possible, but also bear in mind that treatment related mortality, particularly within the first cycle of matrix. OK. Yeah. Um, and then just some other things to be aware of as a as an, a hematology reg, given this is who, who we are um aspiring to be um and and being um some sort of practical things to do with matrix is that you need to avoid tazacin in these patients because it can potentiate the effects of methotrexate so we used to have a prn prescription for meropenem in the event of the patient being neutropenic and spiking a fever overnight so that the cover doctor doesn't get tempted to put them on tazacin which is the sort of 
general neutropenic infection antibiotic. Um, you also need to avoid cotrimoxazole for the week prior to methotrexate. Now, obviously, most patients are not going to be on cotrimoxazole when they present with their primary CNS lymphoma, but when they're getting admitted to the ward for their second or third cycle, someone might have thought to put them on PCP prophylaxis, for example. So it's really important that they've not had that for a week prior to the methotrexate, because again, it can interact. And the other thing to say is that when you are clerking a patient in for me for matrix chemotherapy, make sure there's no evidence of any effusions. So particularly pleural effusions or um, larger ascites, because what can happen is the methotrexate can go into those fluid spaces and then continue to leak out afterwards and make it more difficult for the patient to therefore clear the methotrexate. And so sometimes you you might even need to drain an effusion of the lung before you give your high dose methotrexate, for example. Um, and they they do generally need acyclovir and PCP prophylaxis during treatment, but that is obviously a a local a locally decided thing. But um, generally speaking, at least in my hospital, they have acyclovir and cotrimoxazole prophylaxis as well. Um, to prevent atypical infections and viral reactivation. So yes, it's quite intensive. Um, the other final thing to say is that if they do get an episode of neutropenic sepsis in the first cycle of Matrix, then again, for the next cycle, you're going to remove one of the cytarabin doses because the cytarabin is the thing that can really make it quite toxic for people and, and difficult to manage. So, so that's matrix chemotherapy, but it is highly effective, and um, and yeah, it, it, it uh, as as we've already been through the trials, it you know seventy percent um, progression free survival at seven years is quite impressive. Yeah, that's yeah, considering the attrition rates in the yeah. sort of hematology in general. Yeah. Um, okay, so so what does what does what does the consolidation look like after matrix? Yeah, so consolidation we've already sort of briefly touched on, but essentially your options are radiotherapy or an autologous stem cell transplant. And um, as I said before, uh, most people now really do believe in the thiotipa carmustine autologous stem cell transplant. And it is considered the gold standard for consolidation in patients with primary CNS lymphoma that are fit enough for it. Um, we would commence consolidation within about six to eight weeks of the first day of final induction of chemotherapy cycle. And we would consider it for all patients with non-progressive disease. So that means even if you've had your patient, they've had um, their two cycles of matrix, they've had their stem cells collected, they've had another two cycles of matrix, and their end of treatment scan, their MRI, shows stable disease. So you haven't really managed to do that much with matrix so far. Actually, there you sh you probably should still then go on to do an autologous stem cell transplant in that patient, because we know that the thiotipa carmustine is useful and an important part of treatment for these patients. And certainly, if they've got a a, a partial response rather than a CR, that's okay because the autologous stem cell transplant will often convert a partial response patient into a complete response with the auto. And we actually don't have any data to suggest that having a partial response pre-auto means you'll do any worse than if you had a CR before you go into um, your autologous stem cell transplant, a complete response. Um, so, so yeah, there's been no difference in secondary CNS lymphoma, which I know is slightly different to primary CNS lymphoma. But in secondary CNS lymphoma, the data suggests that there's no difference between um, overall outcomes of patients with a PR versus a CR pre-auto, which I think is really interesting. So basically, unless you've got progressive, definite progressive disease, your patient will probably benefit from having a thiotipa carmustine autologous stem cell transplant. There have been some recent studies looking at whether we can de-escalate the consolidation from an autologous stem cell transplant to more of a chemo consolidation, i.e. a bit less chemo where you don't have to rescue them with their stem cells. And they randomized patients post four cycles of matrix to either 
chemo consolidation or to a with something like our ice um versus a thiotipa based auto and they found that actually although the response rates immediately after consolidation were similar the progression free survival and overall survival was significantly better for patients that had the autologous stem cell transplant at 2 years so the answer is no we cannot deescalate consolidation in those that are fit for an auto and that was done by the, that was demonstrated by the IE LSG 43 study which was confusingly named the matrix study no, of course. Yeah, which which wasn't, um, as you know, it was the other trial that we talked about for Matrix. But this one did demonstrate that we can't ditch the auto, basically. Um, what about whole brain radiotherapy? Well, um, very keen to avoid whole brain radiotherapy first line, because as as per the IELSG 32 study that we talked about earlier, that did demonstrate the benefit. The one that's not called the Matrix study. Yes, is, exactly. Yeah which did demonstrate the benefit of matrix. Um, It showed these effects on cognition that we've already talked about, particularly for those over the age of 60. Um, And so that is, that is a big concern. So we don't do it first line. Um, It does have a role if for whatever reason, your patient, you're unable to harvest their stem cells. Sometimes it's unusual these days, but um, sometimes it's really hard to harvest enough stem cells to be able to do an autologous stem cell transplant. Um, or it might be due to religious beliefs like um, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. And the other situation is if you've got um, residual disease after induction, but you're not fit enough for an autologous stem cell transplant. So perhaps the older patients that were treated with more of the promain approach so the rituximab, methotrexate and procarbazine, followed by the six months of procarbazine maintenance, you might want to then give their brain some whole brain radiotherapy if there's still disease left after that. Um, but otherwise, it doesn't really have a role. And you might ask, well, what about doing focal radiotherapy um, just to, you know, the lump rather than irradiating the whole brain? And sure, that might reduce the effects on cognition, but we know that that's not really very effective um, and you can't really just spot weld the brain like that with radiotherapy. It's very much a whole brain disease. Um, so whole brain radiotherapy, not so keen on unless there are no other options. Also, fatigue is a really common side effect with whole brain radiotherapy. It can be pretty exhausting for patients. OK. So that's consolidation. So what I'm gathering from this is matrix with follow-up autologous stem cell transplant is pretty good. We're getting a response rate of 70% over seven years, uh, which is amazing. Um, I guess the, the next question is follow-up. What If you have got patients who are living for a huge, <laughs> a long period of time and we're patting ourselves on the back, how do, how do you follow that up? Yeah, it's a good question. So the the way in which we assess response is with a contrast enhanced MRI scan. And they say that that should be performed one to two months after completion of consolidation therapy. Um, and then the BSH suggests repeating that MRI every three to four months for two years af- after, um, after that. Um, so, and then further imaging is just sort of judged on a, an individual basis, probably based on the uh, sort of anxiety levels of the patient and, um, and also kind of time elapsed from initial diagnosis. I guess the further away you get from your initial diagnosis, if you haven't relapsed by then, you're less and less likely to, which is why the seven year follow up is quite exciting, I guess, because that's quite a long time from diagnosis. So you would hope that you could maybe use the cure word for some of those patients. Um, so, so yeah, so essentially you're going to do an MRI every sort of three to four months for two years um, and uh, using an MRI scan. In terms of response and how we classify it, a complete response is where there's no contrast enhancement on MRI um, and technically a normal eye exam and clear CSF. So um, if you were being really thorough about it or if you were in trial, you, you may need to do those things as well. Um, if you have a PR, then you've got a 50% reduction in your tumour, but potentially persistent CSF. 
And if you've got stable disease, that's classified as being a less than 50% decrease, but a less than 25% increase. So somewhere between the two as progressive disease, where you've got a greater than 25% increase in lesion or any new lesions as well. So that, so yeah, that's generally how we assess response and, and what the follow-up is. Uh, okay. And then what, what, what does relapse or refractory CNS lymphoma look like? So um, 25% of relapses are asymptomatic and are picked up on follow-up imaging, which is why that imaging that we were just talking about sort of every three to four months for at least two years is really important. And unfortunately, the prognosis of patients that are either relapsed or refractory primary CNS lymphoma is pretty dismal with an overall survival of about 3.5 months, perhaps. Um, Particularly if somebody is matrix refractory or has early relapse disease, it's a real heart sink. Um, and ideally, the best way to treat these patients is to try the, to get them into some sort of trial to get access to some sort of novel agents. Because we know that if they're matrix refractory or they have a very early relapse after matrix, that it's going to be really difficult to give these patients a good outcome. Um, one of the other things to say is that you should consider rebiopsying at relapse particularly if the MRI scan looks a bit atypical or if there are new brain lesions occurring after two years from initial therapy, because at that point, actually two years down the line, it's it's not as frequently seen as a relapse. And therefore you want to make sure it's not some other type of brain cancer or metastatic breast cancer or something. Um, and you must remember to do a complete restaging at relapse. Okay. Um, obviously that's not necessary if it's primary refractory but if you've got a patient that has relapsed you need to be doing the PET scan the ultrasound of the testes and the eye exam again the slit lamp exam to make sure that you know that you're just dealing with CNS disease and that it isn't that it's relapsed in the body as well as the brain and then basically if the patient is fit enough then you have to do reinduction with what we kind of used to call as salvage chemotherapy um, and so if if they're primary refractory to methotrexate based um, immunochemotherapy like matrix or they've had an early relapse, um, then we tend to go for a now an isophosphamide based immunotherapy. So something like R-ICE or R-I-E. So that's rituximab, isophosphamide, atoposide, and the C is the carboplatin. Um, isophosphamide can be a bit scary if you haven't used it before because it can cause quite a lot of encephalopathy um, and seizures and things uh, and is usually given as an inpatient regime and then if a patient has had um, a remission for more than two years since their last high dose methotrexate then actually you can retreat, retreat with another methotrexate based immunotherapy um, treatment strategy again so it just depends on whether they managed to gain two years before they relapsed or whether they are within two years. If they're within two years, don't bother repeating methotrexate because it clearly hasn't worked. But if they've gained more than two years, then perhaps going back to matrix isn't such a bad idea if they're fit enough for it. And then in terms of consolidation, if they've not previously had an auto, then give them an auto if they're fit enough. Um, if they uh, have had an auto before... Um, then you might want to give them whole brain uh, radiotherapy instead as as your sort of second line uh, consolidation. And then there are some novel agents. In particular, I think you, in the future, we're going to see a lot more in the way of um, brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So your BTKIs that we use a lot in CLL. So things like ibrutinib or zanibrutinib um, as a second generation um, BTKI. And the reason why these are quite exciting is because we know they cross the blood brain barrier. So they may be helpful in the future. And so you might be able to get access via a compassionate access scheme or an early access scheme or via a trial potentially as well. Um, and remember that these these remember this dismal outcome for these patients and actually therefore taking a more holistic approach to these patients. Um, talking about intensive treatment versus actually not intensive treatment and making the most of the life that they've got left thinking about palliative care, um, 
radiotherapy to an isolated lesion that's causing a lot of symptoms, dexamethasone, uh, these are other options that you need to discuss with the patient because they, they might not want to go through any more intensive chemo and they might just want to make the most of um, the life that they've got left. But yeah, it's a real area of unmet need at the moment, unfortunately. Okay, a bit of a downer after we've been, we've been doing so well on uh, sort of yeah hitting those like seven year milestones. And everything. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we can pick it up at the end by you giving us uh, the three takeaway messages the gold the gold nuggets for the the exam yeah okay um yeah i'm sorry i always seem to end the sort of malignant chats on on a it's, it's always isn't it relapse and remission the final <laughs> thing, the thing we discuss <laughs> we might need to reorder that <laughs> yeah exactly um it's a happier story for those that respond to matrix so uh what are the three key take home messages i would say first of all make sure you know the difference between primary and secondary cns lymphoma because they are different in um the fact that uh, secondary CNS lymphoma can involve the body either as a synchronous relapse or having been in the body and now relapsing as an isolated relapse in the brain. And we will do a whole different chat on secondary CNS lymphoma, but make sure you know the difference. Okay. And then not only make sure you know the difference in your head in terms of your understanding, but make sure you know whether your patient has primary or secondary CNS lymphoma. So don't forget your PET scan. You don't need to do a bone marrow biopsy, but do remember to do an ultrasound scan of the testicles and do remember to do the slit lamp exam of the eyes. Okay, that's really important as part of your workup. I think the second take home message is a biopsy is really important and a biopsy where the patient hasn't been on steroids, ideally. OK, so really liaising closely and communicating with your neurosurgical colleagues um, to try and not end up in a situation like um, the lady that I, I spoke about at the beginning, um, who never had a diagnosis for three years. And and I think then the second key thing is if they're fit enough for induction, then matrix is the best thing four cycles of matrix followed by if they're fit enough consolidation with an autologous stem cell transplant um and and that's that should be your your gold standard of care and if you do that as you said patients can do really well um if they're if they're looking a bit dodgy then think about um removing one of the cytarabin or even two of the cytarabins but maintain that dose intensity to get across the blood brain barrier um and and then i would say probably the third thing is um just don't forget that your your pre morbid performance status is is really important and um try to look past what you're seeing in front of you to a certain extent and really seek a pre morbid performance status history and past medical history from a couple of weeks prior when the patient wasn't as affected by the CNS lymphoma. Otherwise, you will be tempted to undertreat these patients and not give them the best chance of uh, a long term cure, if I can dare to use that word. But yeah, so so that's um that's primary uh, CNS lymphoma. And I know we've gone quite trial heavy in today's chat, but I think it's important because I have frequently found as a haematology reg, particularly in CNS lymphoma, that people will talk about what they're doing in terms of how they're treating a patient with primary CNS lymphoma as, oh, the MARTA approach or, oh, um, you know, the PROMAIN approach. And actually, I've never really understood what they mean by that without actually knowing about the um the trial and now now that i have read about and understand the trials like the martyr trial i understand that what they're talking about with the martyr approach is this is somebody who's older but fit for an auto and we're going to give them methotrexate cytarabin and rituximab without the thiotipa and i know roughly how many cycles they're talking about and that the fact that they're aiming to do an auto afterwards so it is useful, but until you know about those trials, you can't really um, access what they're talking about. <laughs> like so yeah, many things in hematology. It's, yeah, it's one of those lymphoma <laughs> MDTs, isn't it? When someone exactly. says something, you're like, okay, well, well, I'm out. I'll just yeah. sit and twiddle my thumbs until exactly. they say something I know again. Yeah, so I um, hope today we've covered the most important of the trials in, in yeah. lymphoma so far.
Um, yeah, great. Thanks very much, Anna. That's uh, yeah. No worries. Nice and concise. <laughs> See you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks again for listening to Basics to Brilliance Hematology Podcast. If you enjoy our series, please don't forget to like, leave a review and hit subscribe to never miss an episode. See you next time.